Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Coffee Chats with Experts. I'm your host, Laura Moriarty, and today we have the exciting topic of droplet digital PCR in cell and gene therapies. And I'm very excited to welcome two panelists this morning who are renowned experts in droplet digital PCR, so no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so first up, I have Tara Ellison, who is joining us from the East Coast. Welcome. Hi. And Tara has used qPCR extensively throughout her research experience, including a postdoc at UT Southwestern. And she has produced viral vectors for in vivo studies as part of that work. And since 2013, she's been at Biorad and she's been teaching people all about qPCR and droplet digital PCR as a field application scientist. And she is the United States lead for the droplet digital PCR technology. So I think we have a, a good person on the panel this morning. Welcome again. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, and next up we have Matt Turner. Hey, Matt. Good morning, Laura. Hey, and uh, Matt's joining us from Southern California. How's the weather down there today? It's, uh, we call it June gloom right now, so no sun, but it'll be oh. back. Okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> and so Matt is a biochemist and structural biologist by training, and he has utilized um, PCR for molecular cloning of multiple, uh, multiple target proteins, right? And so he has uh, been verifying the insertion and mutations by qPCR as well as part of that work. So um, since he's been at Biorad, he's been supporting and training people uh, who've been working on viral vector R&D, manufacturing, and um, specifically, he has been helping them around viral titer optimization and sharing all sorts of other best practices and tips and tricks with them. So. Uh, Matt, please, I'm very happy to have you join us today. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. So that is our esteemed panel. And before we kick it off, I want to run through a couple of housekeeping items. So first up, we love to get your questions. So please enter them in the Q&A chat box and we will get those over to the panelists. Make them as hard as you like, because like I said, we have the experts on the call. So now is the time. And if you are listening on demand, don't worry, because we have the, um, your email address, which means we can reach out with an answer to your question that way. So either way, you'll get a, an answer live today, or we'll send you an email follow up. Okay, how are you two doing? Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ready to go. All right, let's do this. So as always, I like to start off with a question of my own just to kind of get the brain cells going a little bit. And here is my first question. So what is DDPCR and why is it considered such a crucial technology in cell and gene therapies? Who would like to kick us off? I can take that, Laura. All right. So, uh, so for DDPCR, droplet, um, droplet digital PCR, of course, uh, it's a method for quantifying nucleic acid. Uh, so um, I like to think of it as basically a molecule counter. So it just counts how many molecules of your particular target sequence of DNA or RNA that you have in your sample. And why is it considered a crucial technology? Well, um, compared to some of the other technologies out there that people have used in cell and gene therapy before, uh, I'd say the two most important reasons would be the fact that it gives you an absolute concentration of your sample without relying on a standard curve, which I think most people on the call know that standard curves can be problematic for multiple reasons. And it's a very highly precise technology. So it's not uncommon to get CVs well below 5%. So um, there are a few other um, reasons as well, but for, for these applications, those are the most important ones. Matt, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I think all of those are really are the key points. And we're, we're talking about droplet digital PCR, which is truly an absolute quantification in comparison to more relative quantifications with qPCR. Um, and, you know, there are other methodologies where you can do absolute quantification, but what's great about droplet digital is it's quite accessible meaning if you have experience with any type of PCR type of technology, it's something that you can easily adapt and build into your workflow. 
Yep. Yeah, that's a really good point. Okay, so I think everyone's brain is uh, warmed <laughs> up a little. So, um, oh, we're going to kick it up a notch with this one. Obviously, this is quite poignant given the topic for today's coffee chat. <laughs> so, okay, so I currently use DDPCR for AAV viral titer. Uh, can it be used for other applications? And maybe just want to explain to the audience, uh, if in case anyone doesn't know, what AAV is. Yeah, so so I can take that question. Um, I, I find so I am a field application scientist for biopharma and biotechs throughout California, and typically when I'm working with droplet digital PCR, AAV quantification is one of the those kind of forefront uh, methodologies that people use digital for. Um, what AAV is? It's a deno associated virus. We can think of it as just a, a virus for for the sake of this conversation, um, but it's commonly used for delivering a, a gene. Uh, whether it be a gene replacement or um, any type of deliverable to an actual cell. And so it's what we consider a gene therapy. Um, AAV titering is what titering means is it's just quantification, actually counting the number of AAV particles. Um, and that's what we see kind of across the field when it comes to AAV quantification. The reason that DDPCR is so important is due to its high precision and accuracy. And you can imagine that if we're delivering a virus, if that virus or that gene therapy is the therapeutic going to patients, it's critical that we have high precision and high confidence and the amount that we're delivering. Now, the, the, the uh, question was, what other applications are there? Obviously, you know, we don't want to buy an instrument and have one thing that we can do with it. And really, it's across the board. So a lot of the things you do with qPCR, will that be host cell DNA detection in biologic workflows or making these AAV particles. Um, it could be other things like copy number variation in native cell lines or doing the same type of experiments with CAR-T therapies. Yeah, Got so it. those are examples in the cell and gene therapy field. Um, I also support many people who are using it for lots of other applications as well, you know, outside of this field. So gene expression is one that I have quite a few people using it for. So qPCR is really good at that if you're looking for large changes, but if you need something that's really low in abundance or something where you're looking for low fold change, digital PCR is a good uh, partner technology there. Um, as well, uh, there are people looking for mutations with liquid biopsy. We have people doing environmental monitoring, um, COVID testing. There's all sorts of um, really interesting applications that it, we can't all talk about today. <laughs> Well, that's great. So definitely um, a, fl a versatile instrument or technology, I guess it can be applied across multiple things. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. So here is, ooh, here's a nice technical question for you. When designing duplex experiments, what considerations need to be made? Who would like to take this one? Um, yeah, I can take that one. I do quite a lot of assay design. So. Mm -hmm. The thing, one thing I like about digital, you know, so I, I, I support both qPCR and digital PCR, and I try to not play favorites too, too heavily, but um, you, people probably know that you can do multiplexing with both qPCR and digital PCR um, using fluorescently labeled probes. So for duplex experiments with either technology, you need to consider how they interact with each other to some degree. So there's assay one and assay two. You want to make sure that they both perform as well together as they do separately. Now, with digital PCR, that is just on average much easier. You know, so digital PCR is an endpoint reaction. And so what I mean by that is we are not making a measurement every cycle like you do in qPCR. We wait until the end. So you make droplets, you do PCR until endpoint, and then you read the fluorescence of the droplets. So SV efficiency just really doesn't matter that much as long as it's good enough. So in terms of what considerations do need to be made um, for digital PCR, it, we do have a two color instrument. That's our QX200, it's two colors. So channel one is FAM, channel two, you can use either hex or VIC probes. Um, we do, um, just recently this year, we launched a new instrument called the QX1 that can read four channels. So you can do even more multiplexing now than you could before. But um, ultimately the same, same things apply, you know, on, honestly, I would just pretty much design assays the way you normally would and try them out. And the vast majority of the time, they do work happily together. 
Brilliant. Great. Anything to add, Matt? No, I think that it's absolutely the truth. And normally that's what I always recommend for folks is let's run them separately and then run them in pairs. And typically, like uh, Tara was saying, is you may have some interaction between the two assays, meaning one assay is more efficient than the other. Um, but the mm -hmm. beautiful thing about digital is you can actually see that it, there's actually a phenotype related to one being more efficient than the other. And as long as we can differentiate the different populations of those two assays, we can still get really accurate data. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And it looks like I have a follow up from that question <clears throat> that may uh, help to shed a little bit more light. So um, you merge the data from two replicate wells that have very different concentrations. Are there outputted statistics to tell you the confidence of the merge result? Got it. OK. okay. Yeah, so, so oh, yeah, go ahead. Tara. I mean, okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> you probably want more detail than that. So uh, you can, it sounds like you've used our software before. You can merge technical replicate wells together in the software, provided that they have the same labeling in the sample field and the targets field. Um, when, you, um, when you have individual wells, the, uh, the error bars associated with that data are the 95% confidence intervals for each well. When you merge the two or, or multiple data points together, you will get a, another set of error bars, which is the total error. And those are also the 95% confidence intervals for that merged set of data. So um, in your particular situation where you mentioned there might be some pipetting error between the two replicate wells, you might end up with some relatively larger error bars for your actual concentrations. But you started off with a question about multiplexing or duplexing. So if you're talking about a situation where you're looking for a copy number and you are multiplexing a target gene and a reference gene in the same well, I'm pretty sure once you switch over to the C and V or the ratio screen, ratio screen, their error bars will probably not actually be that large because it's taking into account that difference in loading. Brilliant. All right. Okay. Let's get you going with another question here. So this is more about reagents. So this person's a regular user of TACMAN. Do, does TACMAN QPCR for several applications? So is there any criteria or minimum requirement to apply for DDPCR? Yeah. Who wants to take that, this? That's a great question. And so mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks ask me this. And, and what I've, I've spoken to my colleagues and a lot of customers, and what I always say is typically when people are looking at DDPCR, it's not like PCR is a new technology. They have assays they've been working on for years that may be very robust in qPCR. And it's a, it's a great question to say, well, I put all this work and I've ordered primers and probes. Can I port those over to DDPCR? Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, typically, what I see is around 95%, something around there, of assays that have been developed in qPCR can be moved over to DDPCR. Um, and so we think of our our platform really is an open platform, meaning you can order TACMAN probes from you know, any vendor that you like, as long as it has a FAM fluorescent probe or a HEX fluorescent or VIC fluorescent probe. The only requirement really is to change out the supermix. Um, and the supermix, uh, the BioRad supermix for DDPCR is required just because we need that to make these droplets, these emulsions. But otherwise, if you have an assay that you've developed, absolutely, it can be moved over. Um, and really, the considerations are quite similar uh, when developing an assay in DDPCR as qPCR. Yep, so just a couple minor points to add to that. Um, there are certain quenchers, Tamara being the, the notable exception, that are not terribly compatible with droplet digital PCR. It is a fluorescent quencher. Um, it's not very common these days. I think most people um, don't really order them anymore unless it's a, a legacy product, so to speak, in their lab. Uh, but so you would want to avoid that. But most other uh, quenchers are just fine for the probes. Um, the other thing is when you, if you are taking a well-optimized assay over from qPCR to DDPCR, there might be a little bit of optimization required. The main thing that might need to change would be the, um, the PCR annealing temperature because the supermixes are a little bit different. Got it, perfect. All right, hopefully that helps. 
Okay. Okay. Here's another nice technical one. All right. This person's asking how to improve the separation of positive and negative droplets. Um, so I can talk about that one. Okay. <laughs> Are both eager to talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it's a really a follow on to the answer that we just talked about, actually. So improving separation of positive and negative droplets. So um, basically, for someone who doesn't have a huge amount of background in DDPCR, um, what we call a negative droplet is a droplet that didn't amplify the target sequence that, that you're looking for. And a positive droplet is considered to be a droplet that has a higher fluorescence that where the probe did um, get cleaved as a result of the PCR amplification. And we like to see those populations far apart. They don't necessarily have to be super far apart, but people do like um, to, to see them that way. The primary way would be um, that gradient optimization as far as temperature for the annealing step. Uh, there are a few other things that you can, you can play around with in terms of sometimes a loading amount of sample. You can play around with that a little bit. Sometimes um, you can look at the sample itself and try to figure out do you, you have PCR inhibitors that might be affecting that separation a little bit. And let's see. Um, those are the main ones that come to mind right now. Yeah, I think I think the main thing are the same considerations again as qPCR. What kind of inhibitors do you have um, in the sample? Is there a large amount of genomic background DNA that could be inhibiting the reaction? Maybe we should mm -hmm. add in some endonucleases to cut up that genomic DNA. Um, mm -hmm. But what I'll say is, yes, we all want really great separation of clusters between positive and negative droplets. But again, the assay is an endpoint assay. So even if you have an assay that maybe has a little inhibition, you know, you're getting these samples maybe from a clinical trial, and so you have no control of how those are collected, and there's inhibitors in there. Um, even if you have poor separation between the negative and positive droplets, as long as we can see a distinct division, meaning two clusters that can be distinguished between, um, you can still get really accurate quantification. So mm -hmm. I, I would say don't let uh, poor separation prevent you from running an assay and getting unique data that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great advice. Brilliant. All right. Coming up, next question. Okay. So this person uses DDPCR to titrate AAV. They were recommended to run 50 cycles routinely to get cleaner results. But in a recent webinar, it was strongly suggested not to exceed 45 cycles. Ooh, what is your opinion? Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> so so yes. I'll answer Gotta this and it. I'll say, <laughs> and I'll say I, I, if that was the recommendation, you know, I think it sounds like this person is very familiar with PCR in general. And so they probably, when they heard 50 cycles, were a little skeptical because you can start amplifying some things that are, have nothing to do with your, your target of interest. Um, so with that, I would not suggest going to 50 cycles um, because at that point, you might start amplifying things that truly aren't what you're looking for. Um, the recommendation that we typically give is to run up to 40 cycles kind of across the board. Um, and, and if at that point you're not getting the target that you're looking for, then we can do some things like running concentration gradients to see if there's a more optimal concentration to run up your sample um, or do a redesign of the assay. Right. To, to build upon that, um, we our, our typical recommendation is 40 cycles. And for the most part, most assays just work pretty well under those conditions. Yeah. I, I can't think of at least one off the top of my head where an actual biorad assay, we do recommend more than 40 cycles. I want to say it's 45, but I'm not 100% sure. And that would be our TERT promoter assays. Mm -hmm. They're um, expert designed. Um, if anyone else you know, on this call has tried to work with a TERP promoter before, it's a very high in GC content. It's a bear to work with. They did a lot of really great work to optimize those assays, and it did turn out that to run a few more cycles did help out. But whenever you, as, as Matt was saying, whenever you start to add cycles to your PCR, you have to be very vigilant about your negative controls or your blank controls, yeah, because yeah. on average, you will start to see more coming up. And so... As long as you're careful about your controls, both positive and negative, it can be okay to add more cycles. Beautiful. All righty. Well, the questions are coming in fast and furious, so let's keep this rolling. And it's always nice to have a controversial question in there too, so <laughs> it keeps everyone fresh. 
All right, here we go. Um, situation. Oh, I like this. You have multiple oh. sets of primers and probes you are testing against a gene of interest. After 40 cycles of thermocycling, they appear equivalent. Question, are there any other experiments you could run to help identify the best primer probe set? And actually, this seems maybe to have already been addressed, but if in case there's anything that we missed. Um, I would say this is a very thorough person. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, honestly, if you were getting equivalent results, I would tend to suggest that you are rather selectively amplifying something. Um, your target of interest specifically. Um, if you were getting different results, you know, I might say, oh boy, that's an interest, that's a difficult question. You know, there's lots of things you could do. Um, but since you are getting the same results, it would tend to suggest that you don't have a lot of off target amplification, for example. But if you do really want to be careful, um, a control that we sometimes recommend for the very thorough is to um, amplify your sample in droplets. But instead of putting it onto the QX reader, what you'd want to do is take those droplets out and do a chloroform extraction to recover the amplified DNA. You want to be very careful, of course, when you're doing this. Probably don't do it in your PCR area. But if you recover that DNA, you can run it on a gel, you can sequence it, you can basically absolutely make sure to yourself that this is amplifying what you think it is. Um, those, and that would be the most relevant side control that I would think of to do. Yeah. Yeah, I love that suggestion. I think, Tara, that's spot on. If you really want to just be sure. And at the end of the day, the way that uh, this, this person is asking this question, I love this strategy. I tell people when I used to do cloning or wanting to insert mutations, we can use all the design engines we want, but there's always a little bit of art there, right? There's things we can't predict for. So I think it's a great strategy. And in your case, you've got a really great location where you're amplifying and they happen to all work. Yeah, I love how you bring in the uh, the use of art in science because there is there's a certain amount of creativity that's needed to to maybe sometimes think outside of the box, right? Um, to really push the boundaries and and, and get the uh, get the results you need. So brilliant! All right, here we go. Let's keep it going. Okay. Here's a great one. Is there a recommended diluent for RAAV samples prior to DDPCR? Hmm. So that's that's a really great question. Um, and um, I know we have a lot of FASs on the team, Tara included, that are working with folks that are doing AAV work. And that's a, and the critical thing is because we're going to be doing quite a large series of dilutions, maybe 10 to the 6 dilutions, um, you want to ensure that those dilutions are linear and you're not losing sample to the tube along that path, meaning sticking to the inside of the tube and you're not recovering it upon mixing. Um, so typically you want to add some type of carrier, um, whether that be poly A is typically what I, what I hear folks are adding. Um, and then I know that I think um, the 2014 lock paper as well as the 2019 uh, Dobnik paper, which should both be in the resources, um, also add a little bit of pleuronic detergent as well to keep these things from sticking. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is I've done side-by-side -side comparisons. You know, I've had customers say, you know, the, the idea of adding a, a detergent doesn't sound like a good idea to me in droplets. And for the most part, that's true. But yeah. we, we did a single sample diluted out with, I believe it was TBS, you know, straight up TBS or PBS versus a chronic buffer. And the results were night and day. It really does make a difference to have a carrier and and possibly pleuronic as well. Beautiful. All right, here's another one. Okay, all right, so using two channels for DDPCR, my result will then be the average of the reading of those. Ah, okay. Is that right? uh, yes so or no? <laughs> yep. so by two channels, I assume you're thinking about the FAM channel and the, the HEX channel, so channel one and channel two. So typically, the way most people would set up their experiments is there would be a, a target gene in channel one and a reference gene in channel two. Um, in that case, you wouldn't be averaging the two results because they're actually looking at two different targets. So depending on your application, let's say you're doing gene expression, 
most people would take the final result of the FAM concentration divided by the hex concentration, and that would be your reading. Um, for let's see a copy number experiment, if you're doing you know copy number and your your dose samples, then that would be the let's say you're working with human or mouse cells, your 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 copy number would be the FAM concentration divided by hex times two as the so-called normal copy number. Now, if you are doing something different where you actually are looking at the same content, the targets in both channels, you could argue you could average those together, but that would be a less common situation. Yeah, I've, ha I've had some folks do that for um, larger amplicons. They'll design an assay for kind of the front end of the gene and an assay for the end of the gene, and they want to kind of make sure that both those assays are running equivalently. Um, I would say, um, kind of like what Tara said earlier, I would definitely do my due diligence to make sure that I'm uh, truly amplifying that. that. Is there any chance that there could be breakage within my DNA? If I'm getting different values, um, then that may not be a great path to go down. Um, but if they're very equivalent, the assays seem to be robust, high efficiency, then I guess technically you could. I haven't ran across that myself. Awesome. All right, let's keep you keep you going. How you how you both doing? Holding up okay? Yep. <laughs> All right. Stretch. Stretch. Yeah, right. <laughs> like stand up, stretch. <laughs> yeah, they're coming in fast, fast and furious. Here we go. So, uh, this person's asking when you want to quantify viral genomes in tissues, the ratio to the reference gene represents the viral genomes or host genome. Is that correct? <clears throat> Okay, so, all right, so um, it sounds like this is, they're looking at like actual integration of a gene in a specific tissue. Um, so when you run DDPCR for that experiment, you'd have your assay for the gene of interest. So let's say the number of virus particles um, that actually got into the cell. So whether that be expansion so that we kind of ensure there's not a lot of viral particles just in solution. So we're, we're going to make the assumption now that it's what's in the cell. Um, so what you can do then is have a secondary assay for a reference gene, um, say RPP30. And so what the ratio of those two values will be is the RPP30 value will be the total genomes loaded in that sample and the value for the gene of interest or the viral genome will be the total virus load within the total sample. So it's total virus over total genomes loaded. So you can think of it more of like an average uh, across all of the cells that you loaded. Yeah, so it sounds like kind of like a bio distribution study mm -hmm. that you have in mind. And yeah, I think I think you're definitely on the right, the right um, yeah. path. Super. All right. Oh, I like this one. What is the minimum number of droplets that can be called positive? For example, if you have four positive droplets, is that enough or is there a threshold that must be achieved? This is perfect for Tara. <laughs> <laughs> nice pass. <laughs> All right. So I'm not a statistician, but I do play one on TV. <laughs> this, um, we, I was just on a, a project actually answering questions just such as these, and it is in the, the final stages. Um, so um, check with your local FIS, I'd say, if you want the, um, the actual document. So um, just briefly, with, um, before I get to your direct question, we have something in the works, which we call our, our limited detection um, stud uh, study, where we basically took a lot of publications out there which are sometimes written for the casual audience and sometimes not so much. So we kind of distill that down into the most important concepts that are relevant to digital PCR. So um, it really goes um, fairly nicely, I think, into determining things like your limit of blank, your limit of detection, um, precision, things like that. But when it comes to your actual question, so what's the minimum number of droplets that can be called <laughs> positive? Um, there is a rule that some people call the rule of three, although we were told not to call it that anymore because that's terribly um, confusing because there's actually a lot of rules of three out there in the world. But we, um, as when it comes to the Poisson distribution, we like to see three positive droplets in a well to call it a, a so-called true positive. Now, if you see one positive droplet in your well, that's a positive droplet. You know, it's not like we're completely pretending it's not there, 
But when you compare that one positive droplet in your sample compared to zero positive droplets in your NTC, chances are your error bars are going to overlap and that it's not statistically significantly positive. So the short answer is three. I've worked with plenty of other labs that feel like that's still not enough and they determine that they want five or they want 10. Um, it really depends on your false positive rate in your blank and ultimately how, how many um, standard deviations you want to put in your calculations when it comes to your significance. Yeah. And, I, and I'd add to that, and it really depends on as well how rare of an event you're looking for. You know, if this is something um, that's extremely rare, maybe it's a one in 10,000 event that you're trying to, it's an editing event that you're trying to detect. Um, the issue is if you only have one or two positive droplets, um, you know, we're taking a pipetted amount, say five microliters of sample, and we're pulling that out of this bulk sample. So if it's one in 10,000, if I loaded that sample in once, I might have captured my, my gene of interest. But if I were to load it again, what's the likelihood that I captured in my pipette tip every single time? Um, because things are randomly distributed, there is a chance that you miss it. Not that it's not there, it's just we're taking a subsample of a very large sample. Yeah, I gotta love um, discussions around statistics. That's <laughs> that's yeah, it's, it's causing some some issues for me right now. But um, we'll we'll uh, <laughs> we won't go into those right now. <laughs> gotta love the math, right? Uh, we all came into science for the math. Okay, here we go. Wow, it's cough. Why me? Which one do I pick? It's really hard. Okay, close my eyes and pick one. Here we go. Um, do you recommend adding BSA to a reaction? Um, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I guess it depends. Um, if you have a very low complexity sample, some folks will do that again with the same kind of reason of like carriers, right? We don't want our DNA to bind to the tube. Um, so yeah, out of context, I'd say it would depend on what, what you're working on and the complexity of the sample you're loading. Like if you're loading pure plasmid, uh, I know folks will add BSA just to increase complexity so things don't bind to itself and don't bind to the tube. Yeah, actually, it reminds me of a preprint for a qPCR test that I just saw recently where they did get better results by adding BSA to the reaction. It is definitely not a common um, adjuvant for digital PCR. Yeah. Um, ultimately, we, we talked about blocking agents earlier when we talked about the, the common diluent buffers. And on average, a nucleic acid um, blocker is going to be more effective than um, BSA, which is typically used as a protein blocking agent. But, you know, if you are having a difficult reaction, it wouldn't hurt to try it out. Yeah. Yeah, run a dilution series and see. Exactly. That's good. Good, good, good. good. All right. So here's a software question. So for multiplexing, can Quantisoft Analysis Pro gate populations automatically, or does it always have to be manual? Um, so I can I can take that one. So mm -hmm. when it, the question, uh, I might have to tag you back a little bit. So when it comes to multiplexing, we it's really easy to do two duplex multiplexing. So you have one target in FAM and one target in HEX. And as long as your amplification is reasonably clear, in both channels, the software will probably handle that pretty well automatically. So it probably will do automatic thresholding and it's reasonably likely that it'll be correct. I do always counsel scientists that you should always check to make sure that the thresholds set automatically are um, in the, the, the range of looking good. Um, now, if we're talking about higher level multiplexing, which might be a little bit more in depth of a conversation to have in this format, but if you are trying to put two targets in FAM or two targets in HEX or all of the above, in that case, the um, Analysis Pro software can gate those populations, but you would it won't do it automatically, though. You would have to do that manually. Got it. Okay. All right. Here's a bit more of an assay design, I guess. Um, if you have less than five copies per microliter using qPCR to test viral load in tissue samples, would you recommend DDPCR to detect the amount of virus in those samples? Ooh, qPCR or DDPCR? We don't hear that question a lot, do we? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a really great question. And I, I, back at you, Laura, as I always tell people that qPCR and DDPCR are quite analogous technologies and they exist together. So in this case, let's say you're doing qPCR and you're seeing five copies per microliter. I would say it always comes back to the what's the percent CV you're seeing. Um, so if you have a very high um, percent CV, let's say your cutoff's over 20, it can't be over 20 percent, um, then it may really be valuable to look at DDPCR, especially if, if five copies per microliter versus one copy per microliter is significantly different or has a actual some type of phenotype associated with that. Um, so I'd say it's worth doing, especially because you're going to take advantage of that higher precision and at the very least maybe rule out, you know, whether or not it's truly one or two copies per microliter, or is this really a five copies for each uh, each sample? Yeah. yeah. The only thing I'd add to that, um, it's absolutely true about the precision. The other thing, kind of piggybacking off of Matt's last comment, is if you are using qPCR, if you got the answer of five copies per microliter, you can probably compare that against a standard curve, right? And the question would be, how is that standard curve generated? Do you actually have five copies per microliter? Um, it may or may not be the case. It's probably close, it's probably in the ballpark, but digital yeah. PCR would give you that absolute quantification. Yep, yeah, that makes total sense. All righty, let's keep keep it going. I guess there's so many questions. It's uh, wow. <laughs> we might need to have might need to have another <laughs> cup of coffee <laughs> another week. <laughs> All right, so for quantification of the level of DNA methylation at a target region, would you recommend using probes complementary to the methylated and unmethylated versions of the target sequence for the two channels in one well? I'll give you time to digest the question. That's a long one. Yeah, I, I can take that. I've, I've worked with several labs looking at methylation status of targets. And so... Um, if you, you know, I'm not sure if you've been doing it by QPC already. For people who aren't familiar with looking at methylation, you do need to bis treat the DNA to convert those methylated um, residues over to um, something amplifiable. Uh, but yes, the short answer is what you would do is you do have a probe complementary to the methylated version. You have a separate probe um, complementary to the unmethylated version. And yeah, you just directly multiplex those in one reaction in one well. The, um, the assay design can be a little tricky because yeah. in, in this situation, we typically have relatively high GC content, which has its own challenges. Plus it means your probes are probably gonna be a little on the short side, but there's, there's numerous publications out there of people who've made it work. Um, looking for methylation of the insulin receptor, for example, looking at methylation in cardiovascular events, things like that. It's totally possible. Awesome. Anything to add, Matt? Or are we good? No, I think that's nope. perfect. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's keep it moving. Why is hot start not typically recommended for DDPCR? I'm sure this is based on multiple data comparisons, but while selecting primers and probes, is it recommended to compare hot start versus not? Do you want to that or? Yeah, if you want to go ahead and take that one, yeah. Mm. So ah. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm a little bit confused with the question yeah. because you use a hot start. Um, but it's true that our documentation doesn't really talk about it much, so maybe it's not very clear. Um, so the TAC enzyme that is in our DDPCR supermixes is modified, so it is not active until it is placed in the thermal cycler at 95 degrees. So that's what that first 95 degrees for 10 minutes step is all about, is activating the TAC so it can so make DNA. So. I'm not sure if you had a different meaning in mind by the hot start, but um, we that's what, yeah, that's what our first step is about. Yeah. Yeah, and ours are typically, so for DDPCR, there is a difference in the hot start if you've, if you've gone with some vendors. So there's um, chemically modified versus antibody modified uh, enzymes. And so ours are chemically modified. Um, and so what makes that really nice is they're very stable. 
right? I remember the days back when we had DNA polymerases that weren't modified, and if you pulled it out of the freezer, that thing's going to start working, right? Um, so the beauty of that is if you want to prep plates, maybe you're going to run multiple plates, um, what you can do is uh, prep them the night before, put them at four degrees, and then go ahead and start the assay the next day. And so that's what I really like about the chemically modified um, DNA polymerase. So in terms of the baseline sensitivity of the primers and probes, water control, is there a recommended max value, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000? Um, and what is it in the primer probe design that helps keep the baseline low? Well, this is, okay, take a second. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so so if you think about droplet digital PCR data, what I usually tell folks um, is if you've ever done flow cytometry, it's flow data. So what's coming through the detector is a single droplet. Um, and that droplet, if you don't have a target, so if we're talking about baselines, so we're assuming that our amplicon's not in that droplet, um, you're going to have some type of basal fluorescence. And typically that's directly associated with the amount of probe that you load. So if you load more probe in each droplet, you're gonna have higher and higher basal fluorescence in those negative droplets. Um, you know, the standard is we always recommend 900 nanomolar of primer and 250 nanomolar as probe. So you can do that pretty consistently and you should get a really nice consistent baseline but there are things that can affect it such as uh, inhibition if you have anything that's in the sample that could possibly quench your probe yeah to add to that um so if you look at our data plots you know let's let's take the one-dimensional plot as an example on the x-axis you have droplet number on the y-axis you have relative fluorescence units and that's where uh, the, the asker, ask, person asking the question was getting those numbers, 3,000, 4,000, et cetera. Those are all relative. So I often counsel people to just ignore the numbers on that axis because yeah. they honestly don't matter that much. As long as you still have a separation between your negative and your positive droplets, you're golden. It doesn't really matter yeah. so much what the baseline fluorescence was. Now, there are lots of reasons for that baseline to shift around. And honestly, even after years of probe design, I still haven't figured out all of them. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll contribute that, to that to some degree. But honestly, I can take the exact same length of probe with the same fluorescent um, pro, um, floor floor and quencher and end up with wildly different amounts of fluorescence when it comes to the DDPCR reaction. And I'm, I'm Part of that is that the way that the probe is quantified by the manufacturer before it gets shipped out to you is yeah. probably spec. And that's not a terribly accurate reading, to be honest. So even if you think you're using 250 nanomolar, chances are it could be well different than that. But again, don't worry so much. As long as you have positive and negative droplets, you're okay. Love it. Yeah, it's always... Um... When you do an experiment and it's not quite the same as the time before, is it the biology? Is it my reagents? It's always a, a head scratcher, especially if it happens on a Friday afternoon. And yeah. then you typically <laughs> just go straight to happy hour and worry about it over the yeah. weekend and you come back the, in the, on Monday. The rage quit. Yeah, right? <laughs> 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 and, you know, usually by Monday you have the solution, right? So yep. um, there's nothing like stepping away and uh, giving your brain time to, to, to get refreshed. All right, so we're, 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 we're running up against time, but I'm gonna get you going with a couple more before we sign off. So this person's asking, let's say there are two primer probes, one is sensitive, more, I guess, more than the other. Does the sensitivity of the primer probe, oh, affect the result of the DDPCR? You wanna take that one, Matt, or I can do it? Sure, yeah. <laughs> That's a really great question. So I'll, I'll make an assumption first that when you mean sensitive than the other, that you mean one is much more efficient than the other. Um, and it's a really great question. I actually had someone ask me this yesterday. Um, and yes, they can affect each other. Um, so if you were to run those two assays by themselves, let's say, and we're looking at the 1D plot, you'll have a negative population and then a positive population that's, say, 10,000 fluorescent units above. And then the less efficient assay will be uh, 
you'll still have great separation, but maybe it only goes up to 6,000 fluorescent units. So we're, we're, we're assuming it's a little less efficient if, we're, if we assume they were both the same exact fluorophore for this uh, hypothesis. Um, so what you would see is if one of those uh, assays is more efficient than the other, so if you get droplets that contain both target genes, um, what will happen is you will see what we call like a shifting of that double positive droplet cluster. Um, but with that said, um, though it may not be perfectly orthogonal, the data is still absolutely valid because remember, DDPCR again is an endpoint assay. So as long as I can differentiate negative droplets, so droplets that do not contain my target gene or my reference gene, compared to droplets that contain both, I can accurately quantify those, even if they don't happen to be orthogonal. And you know, it's very difficult to completely balance two assays. And so it's, it's quite common, but it shouldn't alarm you. Yeah, so it's interesting. Matt went in one direction on that response, and I, my brain was going in a completely different response. <laughs> I think completely valid. So, you know, Matt was thinking in terms of efficiency, and that's absolutely yeah. true. That if you pr are trying to put them together, they sometimes will affect each other. One might win, quote, so to speak, a little bit, but the other is still okay. The um, way I was going was wondering when you talk about sensitivity, are you thinking about limit of detection? Mm. Um, let's say you're looking for the limit of detection of BRAF V600E, and you look at this person's assay, and you look at that person's assay, and you're getting a different limit of detection. Um, that's absolutely common. And Biorad has done a lot of work over the years honing our assay design to get the best uh, specificity um, that we can with our assays, um, as well as the best sensitivity. So there are other assay designs out there. The I would say the so-called more traditional um, assay type designs, you know, so an assay design that you would use for gene expression is not the same as what you would use for a rare event detection necessarily. So um, the sensitivity when you're talking in terms of limit of detection absolutely can be different and that will change the results of your downstream GDPCR if you're talking about what's considered positive versus not. <clears throat> All right. I think we can squeeze in a couple more here. So is DDPCR mostly used for research? Are there any routine clinical applications for DDPCR? Yes, there are. No, I'm joking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants this one? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, so DDPCR is used across the board. Um, so whether it be research, um, analytical development, QAQC, manufacturing. And so if you imagine that you're manufacturing a therapeutic and you need to get actu accurate quantification of that, um, DDPCR is a great solution because again, you're not relying on some third party standard that maybe you have to order or you have to rely on a CRO to deliver to you. Um, so I'll say the short answer is, is it used in clinical applications? Yes. Um, and. And so that can be a more complex question than probably we can answer beyond that uh, here. Um, but it's definitely, um, it is spreading widely. And I think a lot of folks think of DDPCR as a new technology, though I think maybe Tara sees it as it's been around for quite a while, but it's really picking up steam and people are just learning about it for the first time. And so I think as that expands and as people realize the benefits that it's gonna keep continuing. I want to make sure to throw um, an additional part of the answer in there, and that the QX200 in its original form, as well as the QX100 preceding it, was an RUO, or research use only platform. So while we've had CLIA certified labs, um, you know, high complexity labs that have been developing their own lab developed tests for quite some time now, um, until recently, it was considered an RUO platform. Yeah. Somewhat recently, I don't remember the exact date, we did launch a QXDX FDA cleared instrument. And so that has changed slightly our perspective for clinical labs. You know, some of them are adopting that and some of them are continuing to offer the tests that they already developed on the RUO platform. But I just wanted to make sure that was clear for, um, for any regulatory purposes. And that will be different according to the country that you're in as well, right? Yeah, that is true yes. as well. That's yeah. speaking in terms of the United States. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. All right. So I'm going to see if we can squeeze one more in. And I think this is a good one. 
So what's the main advantage of DDPCR over qPCR for cell-free DNA applications? Oh, yep. So that is a good one. Um, well, let's think about cell-free DNA applications. What does cell-free DNA look like? It's short. So typically, it's on average about 160 base pairs or less. Um, it is usually in low concentration, and it's usually surrounded by a lot of other stuff that's not so great for PCR amplification, <laughs> right? So the answer is yes. Um, the man main advantages of BDPCR, and there are you know several, would be the fact that it's um, highly sensitive, um, it's highly precise. So if you are working on the low end, you can probably detect a signal with qPCR, but if you're trying to determine if a person is relapsing from can with cancer, for example, you want to be able to tell a significant difference as early as possible. You're not looking for threefold changes. You might be looking for 50% or 25% increases to have the best outcome for the person, the person you're testing. So very high sensitivity and precision, and then also because it's an endpoint reaction rather than a reaction that relies upon uh, PCR efficiency. Um, if you're working with um, DNA coming from blood or various other biological sources, you don't have to worry as much about the PCR inhibitor carryover. All right. So I think this is a super quick answer to this one. Um, do you, you use a qPCR thermocycler or do you need a separate thermocycler for running DDPCR? Yeah, I'll, t I'll take that question. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a really great question, especially if you're moving over from qPCR. You're like, I have all these thermocyclers sitting around. Can I just use those uh, in, the, in the DDPCR workflow? Um, so with the DDPCR workflow, there is a recommended thermal cycler. Um, and so that is our C1000 deep well thermal cycler. Um, and so the reason that's the recommended thermal cycler is because um, when we generate droplets of our sample, so if we think about the workflow, you prep your, your samples, you add in your assay, and then you generate droplets. So your samples that you're actually going to be amplifying are in those droplets. And so if you were to generate the droplets and take a look at the plate afterwards, um, they actually float on top of a sea of oil. So I always think of them as these little ships floating on a sea of oil. Um, and so what that means is that all of your sample that you're trying to amplify is at the very top of the well. So with the traditional thermal cycler, um, that has like standard volumes of around 50 microliters, um, that means some of your sample is at the very top, right near the, the, the Peltier heating block. And so you can get uh, inefficient heating or amplification of those targets based on where they're located in the well. Um, by using a deep well thermal cycler, we remedy that issue. So it is the recommendation to use uh, a deep well. And just to add on to that, most qPCR thermal cyclers out there are not deep well anymore. There are certain systems that are, um, but typically you would know that because you bought it specifically for a, a known purpose, like food testing, for example. Yeah. Um, most qPCR thermal cyclers do have a, a low profile block, and so it's not going to make very good contact with our, um, our relatively deep well plate. So we don't recommend it. Fantastic. All right, um, and I figured I'd end on this one because this is uh, it's always a, a question that you have to consider, right, when you're, when you're in the lab and uh, you're working on different projects. So how much does it cost compared to qPCR? I guess this is how much does DDPCR cost compared to qPCR? Yeah, so, so I can answer some of that, and I'm sure Tara will have some thoughts. So. Um, if you were to look at qPCR compared to DDPCR, and if we said per well, so this well right here, how much does that cost to run on qPCR versus DDPCR? Um, there is a little bit uh, of a higher pr price for DDPCR per well. But if you take a step back and you think about how much of a plate, uh, how much of your plate is being taken up by standards and replicates on qPCR. So, Traditionally, you're running eight uh, dilutions of your standard. You could be running them in triplicate. So you've already lost a quarter of your plate 
that you could have run samples. Um, and then also with qPCR, because we're not running thousands of reactions in a single well like we do with digital, um, you have to run multiple replicates of the same sample. With DDPCR, we're able to recover that real estate. So typically a DDPCR experiment, you're going to run a positive control, a negative control, and an NTC. And the rest of that plate can be taken up with sample. So when you think about it in a per plate basis, you can run a lot more samples per plate. So actually the price becomes quite comparable at that point. Yeah, Matt, you make a lot of really good points. And that's a lot where a lot of people start off. It's so natural to think of everything in terms of price per well or price per plate or things like that. Um, that's where a lot of PIs think about it too when they come to, when it comes to making their budget. <laughs> But you know, ultimately, I like to think about it in terms of price per answer, or you know, price for yeah. data. Um, and I can personally think of more than one occasion back when I was in the lab where I used the po possibly less expensive technology, and it took me four times as long to get the answer. <laughs> you don't necessarily know it at the time, but in retrospect, I'm like, man, I should have done that differently. So you know, just even though there are some elements of the digital that might cost a little more. If you can get your data faster, if you can get higher quality data and move on with your life, then it, it really might be worth it. You might actually save money in the long run. Yeah, that makes, that makes total sense. Um, and just to kind of round us out here, I always like, um, you know, here's another one from me, uh, just snuck in here. But um, as we're talking about cell and gene therapies, right, what is the benefit for cell and gene therapy applications of using the digital droplet digital technology versus the qPCR technology, and we only have two minutes left, so we get a minute each. <laughs> <It's not fast. laughs> I, can, I can start that answer, but again, I think Matt can probably have something to to put in as well. Um, you know, in terms of benefits, we've talked about advantages. We talk about things like absolute quantification with DDPCR without having to run standard curves. We've talked about very good precision and sensitivity and resistance to PCR inhibitors. Um, you know, ultimately, though, when it comes to benefits, when it comes to the experiments that you're doing, you really want confidence in your results, right? You want to know that if I do the same experiment twice, I'm going to get the same results. Um, I don't have to worry about a twofold difference from experiment to experiment. Or if my lab across the country does the same experiment, they, and let's say they have a different set of standards. Are they going to get a different answer? Or they have a different technician who hasn't been trained as much. Are they going to get a different answer? Um, what we find with digital is that it's more reproducible. It's just, um, uh, a, it gives you on average better answers that are easier to replicate. So that's what I would put forward as the benefit for previous. Right. Matt? Yeah, again, it, it's all down to what Tara said. It's down to the precision and the sensitivity of the platform, you know, especially in, in cell and gene therapy, where the actual thing we're measuring could inevitably be a therapeutic, whether they're delivering it to a mouse model or whatever it might be. So knowing exactly how much you're delivering becomes extremely important, right? And so we want to make sure we can get the smallest error bars as possible there. And then the other thing, which Tara said, but I'll just kind of reiterate, is, again, a lot of folks, especially in biopharma, we're all used to working not only in our own lab, but transferring that technology to another lab across the country to a CRO. And when you think about qPCR, that becomes a little more complicated because it, again, goes back to I have to source standards. Are they using proper technique? I remember in grad school having undergrads run qPCR, and I'd run it next to them and how wildly it would differ. Um, <laughs> with DDPCR, there's not much that you can do short of just completely messing up how much you loaded into the well. And even with that, if you're running good reference genes, you can you can uh, correct for that. Um, so if, if you think about that transfer, how long it's going to take to get other labs up and going, it's a much easier technology to move across different sites. Beautiful. I think that's a great way to end it, especially knowing that the cell and gene therapy um, therapeutics are being you know, shifted from company to company uh, based on the expertise of the different companies and the CRO and CMO partners. So I think that that, that, totally, um, that totally fits. Well, it just remains for me to thank both of you. Thank you very much. I think we put you through your paces. Time to go lay down, um, have a celebratory <laughs> drink if you can, or just go to your next meeting, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. 
Yeah. <laughs> and to our audience, thank you so much. We really enjoyed getting your questions. That's what makes it so much fun. Um, and it just remains for me to give a quick plug to some of the other webinars in our Coffee Chat series. Um, we have topics such as Western blotting. Um, we have uh, topics around multiplex immunoassays, qPCR, as well as flow cytometry and uh, larger scale commercial chromatography. So do click on the link and sign up for some others on demand or live if you're lucky. And we look forward to seeing you next time. So thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye bye for now. <laughs>